platypus in nature tries to save his friend on the Platypus Guardian. Then lace up for Yakka Australia at work. Later, believing in Australia. Tonight, the multi-billion dollar contract to start digging on the suburban rail loop. Also tonight, commuters told to steer clear of the V-line tomorrow ahead of peak hour strike action. World leaders struggle to secure a deal at the COP28 climate summit. And Netball Australia's CEO quits after an ugly pay dispute with players. Good evening, Tamara O'Dine with ABC News. The Premier Jacinta Allen has stared down critics of Labor's flagship infrastructure project, the Suburban Rail Loop, inking a multi-billion dollar deal with international backers to dig tunnels in Melbourne's east. The project will take decades to complete, and while the Premier is still unable to say how much it'll cost, it's estimated to be upwards of $100 billion. And there are warnings tonight that a scarcity of workers and materials could drive the price even higher. Here's our state political reporter Richard Willingham. This suburban block in Melbourne's east will become a giant hole to launch boring machines that will dig twin 16 kilometre rail tunnels between Cheltenham and Glen Waverley. The suburban rail loop line will be the busiest train line in Melbourne. The $3.6 billion tunnel contract with an international consortium is just one piece of the mega project that will eventually loop all around Melbourne and could cost more than $125 billion. Experts warn a train linking the middle rung suburbs is not needed and risks draining funds away from the outer suburbs where projects are more pressing. The government's leaping into the dark. Um, it knows that it doesn't stack up now, but it's still going ahead. And this is a major worry um, that governments could make such a, an irrational decision on such a monumental project as this. I don't think the government has explained clearly what problem they're trying to solve with Suburban Rail Loop. They are betting all of their infrastructure eggs on one project and one basket. The Premier unwilling to say how much taxpayers will be on the hook for if the contract is torn up. We're seeing plenty of blockers and knockers. People who are wanting to stop the Suburban Rail Loop are saying to these communities, you might as well stay stuck in your car. Labor is also mum on the full cost of the entire orbital line. The first leg alone will cost between 30 and $35 billion. It wants help from the federal government, but has only secured $2.2 billion. The significant challenge is ahead, and it's not just the eye-watering cost. A new report shows Australia is facing a significant shortage of workers for these infrastructure projects. It also warns there's a scarcity of materials, which will only drive the price of projects up. The infrastructure market is at capacity, and that's now a question of project slippage, not if, but when, and by how much, and at what cost. So it's really not prudent to go ahead and push more work into an already overheated market. Infrastructure Australia's report found the nation needs 230,000 extra workers in the sector. No project is immune from the issues around market capacity. It's a problem the state can't walk away from. Richard Willingham, ABC News, Melbourne. Thousands of V-Line commuters have been urged to avoid taking the state's regional train service tomorrow morning due to staff strike action. V-Line trains won't be running between 3am and 7am when transport workers walk off the job demanding better pay and job security. A limited bus service will replace trains but significant delays and cancellations are expected to continue throughout the day. The industrial action comes after more than six months of failed negotiations between V-Line and the rail, tram and bus union. There's no doubt about it, if you can avoid travel tomorrow morning on the V-Line network, please do so. We have been negotiating in good faith and remain hopeful that an agreement can be reached soon. Uh, but if VLAN refuses to budge, then you know we will we won't hesitate to keep the fight on. And if more action is required, then so be it. Attempts to forge an historic deal at climate talks in Dubai are hanging by a thread after a draft agreement failed to include any mention of phasing out fossil fuels. The watered-down text was released overnight at the COP28 summit, sparking immediate anger from Pacific Island nations. Energy reporter Daniel Mercer has been following the summit in Dubai. In the final frantic days of COP28, the youngest member of Australia's delegation oblivious to the chaos around. Apart from, you know, 
reminding everyone why they're here. Uh, like she's literally the embodiment of the future. Her mother, on the other hand, fully aware of the stakes at play. It's coming to the pointy end. There's obviously some intransigence from certain countries that don't want the mention of fossil fuels. Those stakes were raised higher last night when a draft agreement failed to make any mention of phasing out or phasing down fossil fuels. In its place was a reference to reducing both the consumption and production of the fuels. We have a text and we need to agree on the text. The time for discussion is coming to an end. Many poorer and more vulnerable countries were dismayed. If we do not have strong mitigation outcomes at this COP, then we will be, this will be the COP where 1.5 would have died. We will not sign our gift certificate. Until two years ago, no COP had ever directly mentioned any of the fossil fuels as part of efforts to tackle global warming. That all changed in Glasgow, when a commitment to phase out coal was included for the first time. But here in Dubai, efforts to widen the net to include oil and gas are coming unstuck. So we've engaged in very good faith, knowing that there are countries that respectfully, I say, have a different view. Saudi Arabia, for example, is on the public record as having a very different view. We know where the big sticking point is, and it's around energy, specifically whether we phase down or we phase out unabated or full fossil fuels. But COP28 is being held next door to Saudi Arabia, the world's biggest oil exporter, has always cast a long shadow over its chances of achieving a deal to phase out fossil fuels. With just a couple of days left of negotiations, time is running out to prove the doubters wrong. Daniel Mercer, ABC News, Dubai. Teachers are calling on governments to adequately fund public schools as education ministers prepare to negotiate a new funding deal. An independent review has laid out recommendations to lift student outcomes, retain more teachers and close the gap for students most at risk of falling behind. After 15 years of teaching high schoolers, Alice Leung still thinks it's the best job in the world. But she's being worn down by the crisis facing public schools around Australia. The workload is unmanageable and is not getting any better. Hold on. Workloads are growing, teachers are leaving and many students are falling further behind, with an independent review finding that needs to be urgently addressed. You're not going to be teaching at your best when you've got 50 students with you instead of 30 or, or 24. The expert panel calls for evidence-based teaching methods in the classroom, more professional development and mentoring for teachers and incentives for staff to work in disadvantaged schools. It's about money, uh, but it's also about what that money's spent on. The report also found that while the vast majority of public schools aren't funded to the minimum standard for the sector, most private schools are, and some are getting above that threshold. And the independent sector is worried reform could come at their expense. What we are concerned about is ensuring that um, we don't proceed on the basis, and it has been raised by some people, that that can somehow be achieved by removing resources from other sectors. The nation's public schools are doing the heavy lifting when it comes to educating disadvantaged students. Public schools enrol nearly twice the number of students than the non-government system. About a third of the students in public schools are from disadvantaged socioeconomic and education backgrounds. That's nearly three times the number in non-government schools. We have one of the most segregated school systems in the OECD. Not by the colour of your skin, but by the size of your parents' pay packet. This review sets the scene for the states, territories and federal government to hash out a new school funding deal. But with such entrenched inequality to address and a need to lift student outcomes, the group are going to have their work cut out for them in 2024. Claudia Long, ABC News, Canberra. Sky News has handed the federal court a copy of a secretly recorded private discussion between Brittany Higgins' fiancé, her lawyer and a friend about her evidence during Bruce Lehrman's defamation case. The court ordered the media organisation to produce the recording this morning, but whether it will be admitted as evidence is still being decided. Elizabeth Byrne is following the case. 
The conversation is alleged to have taken place during lawyer Leon Swire's birthday dinner, attended by Brittany Higgins' fiancé David Shiraz and one of their friends, Emma Webster. Bruce Lehrman is suing Network 10 and journalist Lisa Wilkinson over an interview during which Ms Higgins first made her allegation she'd been raped at Parliament House. The defamation case was launched after Mr Lehrman's trial was abandoned last year with no findings against him. The dinner coincided with Ms Higgins' cross-examination. Today, Mr Swire denied anything untoward happened. All my private conversations with David Shiraz and Emma Webster were on the common understanding that Brittany was under cross-examination and no one was to talk with her about the substance of her evidence or the manner in which she was giving it. Today, the court lifted its ruling against two other secret recordings made by Brittany Higgins. One, a conversation involving her then boss, Michaelia Cash, and her chief of staff, who were trying to convince her not to resign, telling her they wanted her to flourish and she could work from the Gold Coast. Ms Higgins became increasingly distraught. None of it was OK, and the way it was handled was wrong. I am just saying, please don't let this happen to anyone else. I can't go back into it. It's a re-traumatising experience. Later in the day, Bruce Lehrman's lawyer Matthew Richardson pressed Network 10 producer Angus Llewellyn on why he'd blurred out a message on a document inviting Ms Higgins' father to a meeting and showing empathy to her. I'm making a TV program, not preparing a police document. By blurring it out, you gave a misleading impression to viewers of the program. Tomorrow, the court will consider how it should deal with the secret recording given to Sky News. Elizabeth Byrne, ABC News. Police are pleading with drivers to take care on the roads over Christmas. As the force reveals, there's been a significant rise in low-range drink driving. A deadly crash in Oakley East this morning that killed an 85-year-old man has taken Victoria's road toll to the highest number in 15 years. Police have announced they'll be extending their road safety operation this year by a week and will be conducting 50,000 extra breath tests, including on a major Melbourne freeway next weekend. We have seen this year a significant amount of trauma um, with people <clears throat> undertaking a single act of non-compliance a little bit over 05, a little bit over the speed limit, but dead or injured as a result of that. We cannot have that. Three Australian meat exporters are expected to resume trade with China amid easing tensions between Canberra and Beijing. Since May 2020, 10 abattoirs have been suspended from exporting to China, a decision that's cost Australian farmers and exporters hundreds of millions of dollars in lost trade. The federal government has welcomed the move as it seeks to stabilise its relationship with China. Red meat is just one of the industries hit by sanctions imposed by Beijing in the past three years as a consequence of political tensions. Trade barriers still apply to Australian lobsters, red wine and seven other meat processes. Stephen Miles is set to become Queensland's next Premier, taking the reins from Anastasia Palaszczuk on Friday after her shock resignation. It follows a short-lived leadership contest. It might not be official yet, but the New Look leadership team is wasting no time getting to work. The government I lead will be absolutely focused on the task of helping Queenslanders and that's why today we're announcing that we will freeze rego, freeze car rego for the next year. Keen to push cost of living help at their first press conference since striking a factional deal for the jobs of Premier and Deputy, a pact that's set to be rubber stamped by the Labor caucus on Friday. I'm grateful that he is supporting me. We have been friends for a long time. We share a vision for Queensland. I'm absolutely convinced that Stephen Miles is the, is the best leader for Queensland now and for the future. Oh, look, there's been a lot of discussions between a lot of people over the last few days, but this is an agreement between Cameron and I. The agreement ending a brief two-way contest to replace Anastasia Palaszczuk. Yesterday, Shannon Fentman declared her intention to nominate for Premier, but withdrew this morning, saying it's clear that a majority of Labor members of Parliament will support Stephen Miles to be the next leader. He says she's doing a great job as Health Minister. 
I have certainly asked her to stay on in that role and also take a leadership role within the government. Cameron Dick will also retain the role of treasurer. There will be other changes to cabinet, but Mr Miles is being tight-lipped for now. We're not getting ahead of ourselves. The caucus meets on Friday to elect uh, the leadership team. I, I see the same people who have led to the same crises that are gripping Queensland. Ten months out from the state election, the incoming Premier says Labor is the underdog, but he's confident they can win. As well as focusing on cost of living, he's also signalled a change around delivering infrastructure for the 2032 Games. Now saying an independent delivery authority is the right way to go after the government previously dismissed it. We'll start work just as soon as I get my feet under the desk. Kate McKenna, ABC News, Brisbane. Coming up on 7.30 with Laura Tingle tonight, the wave of same-sex schools deciding to go co-ed. We need um, the ability to communicate confidently with the opposite gender. Co-ed schools really provide for that. I certainly think from a girl's perspective, independent uh, single-sex schooling is not going anywhere. Also, James Elder from UNICEF provides an eyewitness account of the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Israel says Hamas is on the verge of dissolution and the country is open to discussing who could take control of the Gaza Strip. For the people of Gaza, infectious diseases are spreading throughout the overcrowded shelters and civil order around aid deliveries is almost completely broken down. Clouds of smoke fill the skies above southern Gaza. Israeli forces ramping up their assault on Khan Yunus. Hamas has released this video purportedly showing clashes on the ground. Amidst the fighting, civilians are still sheltering along the front lines. In Rafah, the latest airstrikes have levelled buildings where many were seeking refuge. There is no safe place in the Gaza Strip. Not at home, not in the streets, not in the school shelters. It is not safe, as they said. On the ground, people are starving. Desperate Gazans are swarming aid deliveries. The UN says looting is making humanitarian efforts impossible. UNRWA might not be able to continue to operate because of the civil order breakdown. Israel's government is looking to the future. It says it has no plans to stay in the Gaza Strip long term. It's open to a third party taking control, but there are conditions. This body will not act with hostility towards the state of Israel. All the rest, in my opinion, can be discussed. It certainly will not be Hamas and also will not be Israel. Some are pushing for it to be the Palestinian Authority, which currently governs parts of the West Bank. But the PA is unpopular with many Palestinians who accuse it of being corrupt and collaborating with Israel. And there's a real possibility Gaza will be left with a power vacuum on the back of a humanitarian crisis. The future remains bleak for the millions displaced. Children at this camp say they've lost hope. My dreams have been lost. They're nothing. The Israeli government claims it's the beginning of the end for Hamas. For civilians on the ground, an end to the fighting can't come soon enough. Alison Horn, ABC News, Jerusalem. The United States says it's deeply concerned for the well-being of detained Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny, who's been missing for several days. Navalny's supporters say he's been moved from the penal colony where he was serving his sentence and his whereabouts are unknown. They were expecting him to be transferred to a stricter jail but are being kept in the dark. The disappearance of the Kremlin critic comes a few days after President Vladimir Putin confirmed he'll stand for another six-year term. The main thing for us is to find him as soon as possible because uh, right now he is completely alone and he is uh, literally in the hands of people who once tried to kill him. Uh, so we don't know what they will do again. Australian actresses Margot Robbie, Sarah Snook and Elizabeth Debicki are in the running for Golden Globes.
Robbie has been nominated for Best Actress as the box office hit Barbie dominated the 2024 nominations with nine nods. Oppenheimer was close behind with eight, including Best Picture Drama. Melbourne-based Sarah Snook is up for the Best Actress in a Drama Series category for her role in Succession. And Elizabeth Debicki, who played Princess Diana in The Crown, was nominated for Best Supporting Actress. The winners will be announced at the Golden Globe ceremony in January. Well, it's set to be a very white Christmas for the 74 expeditioners and crew heading off on the RSV Noyina tomorrow on a month-long resupply mission to Antarctica. On board is more than a million litres of diesel, 500 kilograms of coffee beans and nearly 750 litres of ice cream. The Noyina has made headlines this year with revelations it couldn't pass under Hobart's Tasman Bridge to refuel. And its second voyage comes amid grave concerns about the impact of climate change on the icy continent. Researchers on board will measure sea ice, monitor the continent's bird population and retrieve whale recording devices from the seabed. Similarly, we're also going to be deploying another float, something called an Argo float, and we'll be going in close to the uh, Vanderford Glacier, and that's going to be a device that'll measure, among other things, the water temperature, so we can have a better understanding of climate change down south. To Finance Now, and tonight, Alan Kohler takes a look back at the float of the Aussie dollar on its 40th anniversary. I'm pleased to say that today the, the market has endorsed the government's view, that was, that uh, it was a correct decision to take and that we finished trading at about uh, the rate we were trading at in the middle of last week. Well, that was Treasurer Paul Keating at the end of the first day of unfettered trading in the Australian dollar, December the 12th, 1983. And it was high fives all round, although it was never going to be allowed to crash that day. It started sinking two months later, actually. Now here's a chart of the exchange rate from 1971. From 1976 to the day of the float, it was set through what was called a crawling peg, to the US dollar that is, set by a committee of cabinet on the advice of the Governor of the Reserve Bank, the Treasury Secretary and the Head of Prime Minister and Cabinet, aka the Troika. It hit the all-time low in March 2001 and then nine months later China joined the World Trade Organisation and commodity prices started flying, which pushed the Aussie to a peak of $1.10 in July 2011. The current price is about 10 cents below the post-float average of 75.5 US cents. Today the dollar celebrated 40 years of freedom by going for a quick trot to 65.9 US cents. Commodity prices mostly fell, but not much. Global markets mostly rose, also not much, and the local market went up half a percent with falls by some big miners, more than offset by gains by banks and retailers. Reserve Bank Governor Michelle Bullock gave a speech today containing this graph of the decline in the use of cash. She said that distributing it is becoming uneconomic, so those who use banknotes and coins might need to bear more of the costs. Well, that should hasten the demise of cash. And that's finance. The embattled CEO of Netball Australia, Kelly Ryan, has quit the job effective immediately following months of controversy in the sport. The governing body announced Ryan's departure today following a tumultuous two and a half year tenure that's ended with an ugly pay dispute with players. That protracted dispute is said to be resolved imminently while the search for a new CEO begins. The board says Ryan will be remembered for strong leadership, but that she had a tough time in the role. This was purely Kelly's decision. We've got in principal agreement on the CPA and she felt it was time for her to now spend more time with her family. Australian Vice-Captain Steve Smith is expecting a bowler-friendly wicket at Perth Stadium for the start of Thursday's test against Pakistan. The 34-year-old has also brushed off questions about his playing future after not performing to his usual standard at the World Cup and the Ashes. By his own admission, 2023 has been an off year for Steve Smith. After a modest Ashes series and a below par World Cup, the 34-year-old is looking for a return to form. He's hoping to achieve that with more of an oil change than a full-blown service. Not overthinking it, not overplaying too much, not changing too much, just going out and trusting what I do and uh, doing it for longer periods of time, hopefully. 
The first test against Pakistan, the perfect place to find form. Smith's last visit to Perth Stadium saw him post his most recent test double century. Although ground staff have warned this year's pitch won't be as batter friendly as last summer's. Definitely not having as much grass on top is, is where I'm aiming for. Um, and maybe just having a, starting the game a little bit harder so it does give that chance to deteriorate later on in the game. Despite this, Smith remains confident patience at the crease will bring rewards. I think there's a little bit of grass on it. I can see from afar, so maybe a bit of seam movement early on and probably get a bit flatter as the game goes on. Maybe some cracks if the, the heat stays. And he shouldered arms to any talk about retirement from the longer form of the game, adamant he's got plenty more to give. I just take it day by day and enjoy my time playing and while I'm enjoying it I'll keep playing. Um, yeah, I'm not in any hurry to make any decisions or anything. The first test starts on Thursday. Garrett Mundy, ABC News. A young autistic pilot's quest to be recognised by the Civil Aviation Safety Authority as capable of obtaining a commercial flying licence is one step closer. 22-year-old Hayden McDonald successfully flew his tiny ultralight on a three-month journey, landing back home in Esperance after flying solo around the country. Touchdown. Yeah, there we go. Done it. Good boy. The end of a long journey of self-discovery. For autistic pilot Hayden McDonald, a moment of emotion. Oh, mate. His solo circumnavigation of Australia complete. <laughs> Just a pure emotion. Over three months, 15,000 kilometres and 80 hours of flying, battling heat, thunderstorms and bushfires, the 22-year-old navigated his tiny aircraft alone to break down the barriers to stop him becoming a commercial pilot. I learned so much on the way. I learned so much lot more what an average pilot can learn. His greatest believer, never in doubt. Well, like we always knew he could do it. That wasn't the question. It, it's just the fact that he has. Two years ago, Hayden was blocked by the Civil Aviation Safety Authority, denying him progression beyond his recreational pilot certificate because of his autism, shutting down his dream to fly for the RFDS. I hope this is something that um, Castle will take note and a lot of people take note. It's a big deal and even though I try to tell myself, no, it's not. When Hayden was alone in the sky with his mascots, he had support on the ground. A former ANSET pilot helping with advice. Really good. There's been a few testing times and a few difficult conversations, but he's done it all himself and I'm amazed. I'm very, very proud of him. Now, a welcome home present, an email from CASA offering to talk about his future before Christmas. My message to CASA as well, please don't do me as a one-off and actually consider as well other autistic pilots as well. In a statement, CASA says they're committed to finding ways to support as many people as possible to be able to fly. Mark Bennett, ABC News, Esperance. To the weather now. There were some isolated storms in the far west and the central district overnight, with Mount William receiving 16.2 millimetres. Minimum temperatures were 5 to 8 degrees above average. The lowest of 11 was recorded at Mount Hotham. Thick low cloud and fog covered the south and east this morning. There were some isolated storms in the far west and over the eastern ranges this afternoon. Maximum temperatures range between 24 and 37. The state's high of 41 was recorded at Hopeton, Mildura and Walpiup. In Melbourne, we reached our high of 33.2 degrees at 4.30 this afternoon. Outside now, it's 32. Interstate today, it was foggy then sunny in Sydney, wet in Darwin, mostly sunny in Brisbane and Hobart had a late shower. Tropical cyclone Jasper is currently east of Cairns off the Queensland coast, producing thick cloud over northeast Queensland. There are also broad areas of cloud over southeastern Australia. A trough over southwest Victoria will move eastwards tomorrow and clear the state by Thursday morning. Tropical cyclone Jasper will bring intense rain and winds, large waves and storm surges to the north Queensland coast tomorrow. And there'll be more showers and storms over western Queensland, the northern tropics, New South Wales, Victoria and Tassie. For the capital cities, it'll be partly cloudy in Sydney and Brisbane. Late showers for Hobart, sunny in Perth and a shower or two for Adelaide and Darwin.
Back home, we're heading for a partly cloudy day with showers and thunderstorms in the west. They'll move across the state before a cooler westerly change in the southwest at night. It'll be another warm to hot and humid day with moderate north to northwesterly winds. Fire danger will be extreme for the Mallee, the Wimmera and northern country. On the bay, 10 to 15 knot easterly winds will turn southwesterly and get up to 20 knots in the late evening and waves will be around a metre. There'll be strong winds along the East Gippsland coast. For Melbourne tomorrow, it'll be a partly cloudy day with showers and possible storms with large hail and heavy falls. We're heading for a top of 33 down to 23 tonight. And looking ahead, Thursday a shower or two, 25. Friday and Saturday partly cloudy, 23 and 22. Sunday mostly sunny, 24. Monday a possible shower with a top of 29. And that's it for this evening's bulletin. Stay with us now for 7.30. Welcome to the program. Shortly, I'll speak to UNICEF spokesperson James Elder, who's just spent time in Gaza. But first, Last-minute negotiations are taking place